March 19, 1921, one of the biggest and most significant military engagements of the Irish War of Independence took place across the green fields of Crossbarry Cork, almost halfway between Cork City and Bandon. The Cork 3rd Brigade Flying Column led by Tom Barry found themselves in the precarious position as they took up billets on the hillside not far from the monument at Crossbarry today. A significant force of British soldiers began to encircle and close in on their position, having been tipped off to the column's location. As the Crown forces arrived, an IRA piper named Flor Begley played martial airs on his war pipes, and so began a tactical battle as the IRA column attempted to escape both the literal and proverbial noose as the Crown forces closed in. In the first quarter of 1921, the Cork Tower Brigade Flying Column had escalated their activity and had been in a number of significant ambushes and attacks across West Cork. In the weeks leading up to Crossbury, they had also experienced significant losses as the Crown forces altered their tactics and began roundups and raids on suspected IRA volunteers. Indeed, the attempted roundup at Crossbury was the result of a failed ambush at Upton just a few weeks earlier. Standing here at Upton Railway Station, and on the 15th of February 1921, there was a, an ill fated ambush from the IRA's perspective here. Uh, it was an ambush on a train coming through the station, and the IRA were just recently targeting trains and had had a couple of successes with that around the country. So Charlie Hurley decided that he would target a a train here. The reason being the trains had just recently started carrying troops after a, a industrial action that prohibited them from doing it. So Hurley decided he would ambush a train here. Now he expected to meet a small party of soldiers who travelled regularly on that train. Unfortunately for him uh, about 50 other soldiers had boarded the train at Kinsale Junction, the next stop up the line. The scouts had failed to board the uh, train at, at Kinsale Junction. So the train rolled in here with 50 additional soldiers on it and the IRA knew nothing about their presence. Even though the scouts had tried to cycle, they, they, by the time they got here, uh, the action was already underway. There was a ferocious firefight in the station during which uh, a number of civilians were, were killed. Uh, three IRA or two IRA were killed outright and one was mortally wounded here as well and the uh, British side took six casualties uh, all woundings we don't think anyone was killed here so one of the wounded was Charlie Hurley the commander of the third brigade who commanded the, the action here and Hurley was taken uh, east of here uh, to a farmhouse in the Bally Murphy townland and his being in that farmhouse uh, commenced the Crossbarry ambush uh, a little over a month later. Okay so, okay, so I'm standing here in the townland of Ballymurphy, which is where Charlie Hurley was on the morning of the Crossbarry ambush. He was recuperating in a farmhouse uh, not far from here uh, after his wounds sustained at the Upton uh, ambush. Indeed, I'm standing across the road from a monument that marks, uh, that honours the life of Charlie Hurley, I suppose. Uh, the first gunshots of the morning were heard up on this hillside uh, when a British raiding party came across the farmhouse in question. Uh, Barry or Hurley tried to escape and on his way out the door he was basically shot dead. Uh, the column, who were at that stage down on the cross Barry Road, heard those shots and that was one of the things indeed that alerted them to the fact that there were uh, British reasonably close on this side and it may have, have stimulated a redeployment of men down there where they basically moved a flanking section a little further north by some of the accounts anyway. Uh, the column itself on the morning in question before Hurley was, was shot they were on the hillside opposite me here. We're standing on the on one side of the Onabui or Onaboy Valley. That's a little river that runs through the valley below me. It, it, it enters the sea at Cork Harbour just beyond Carrigaline Town. And the column were in billets all along the hillside here behind me. And they moved down onto the Crossbarry Road, which is generally in that direction. Some of them were a little further west of that hillside as well. And the hillside is quite important because a lot of the elevated ground that you see behind me, particularly towards the left of your shot here, was held by the IRA on the day in question. And that's what was, if you like, interesting about Crossbarry. The IRA were very military based, if you like, at that stage. They were commanded militarily effectively. Uh, and I don't think the British were expecting that. They had rounded up columns at Dripsy. They had rounded up a column in Clonmult. And they had done that quite easily. And I think they probably expected to do it quite easily here. But what they came across was a very effective military unit. They weren't expecting to fight a war. They were expecting to be on a roundup. They ended up in a military action, which I think they weren't ready for. Had the War of Independence gone on... 
actions like Cross Barry may well have stimulated uh, more militant action by the British. Things like artillery on, on high ground like this would have possibly dislodged the IRA, probably dislodged the IRA from their positions below. Uh, heavy machine guns might have been deployed more effectively uh, on the day in question. But they didn't do any of those things because they weren't expecting to find a column commanded as well as it was. Uh, and indeed, you can talk as well about professional soldiers like the British who weren't as motivated as the rebels they were fighting. And you find that in wars all over the world. The rebels are fighting for a cause. Uh, so Barry commanded his men very, very effectively. Uh, and the British, I think, weren't expecting that. And they weren't really up for the fight as much as the rebels either. And that is probably why they seemed to break and run so easily on several occasions during the Cross Barry fight. And if you follow me now, we will speak about some of those engagements and we'll speak about how Barry deployed his men and how seemingly easily on many occasions he defeated British forces in these hills and valleys around Cross Barry. So back behind me you can see Beasley's farmhouse, which was one of two farmhouses that marked the extreme west of the IRA's line. The IRA, as we said a while ago, uh, moved, were in billets all around the town lands, mostly to the north and west of us here. Uh, they came into a field, they tell us, adjoining the Cork Bandon Road, which is the road next to me here. Uh, the field, we, they don't say where, but it was more than likely west of the farmhouses behind me. And from there they were deployed along a line here, along the road and up to the monument, which is about 100 yards behind the camera here. Uh, they were deployed with one flanking section close in on a boreen just behind Beasley's and then right up to the monument, uh, which we'll explain a little bit more about that deployment in our next segment. Uh, the reason they were deployed here was because the first... It was thought generally that the... The, the noises of the lorries that they could hear approaching from all angles generally persuaded them that the the lorries coming from Bandon in the west would reach, would reach this area first. Uh, so they deployed along here to ambush them. The British came from the west first, luckily for the IRA, and luckily again they had actually discarded many of the troops from the trucks further west because what they were doing was raiding with infantry parties, so they were moving on foot most of the time and the trucks were going ahead of them to pick them up again. So three trucks came into the ambush position. Uh, the first one really made it as far as Beasley's behind me, uh, and then there were two more on the road behind that. The IRA opened up on those three trucks. Meanwhile, it, it, the numbers vary depending on which account you read, but it would seem that four trucks came in close behind them and they were hit by a flanking section which Barry had back to his right and rear. So, all in all, about seven trucks were engaged. Barry tells us it was up to 12, and the reason that he says that was probably that there were more trucks came from Bandon afterwards. And it would seem, according to some accounts, that some of those trucks immediately turned around and headed west again, leaving the seven trucks ahead of them to be engaged by the IRA. Uh, the firefight didn't last terribly long. As I say, there weren't many British troops on those trucks. Uh, so they abandoned the trucks quick, quickly enough and retreated over to the south here. And, and I should have said, actually, as well, in, in defeating the British on the road here, one of the reasons they did that was they deployed some men on the southern side of the road here. Depending on which account you read, they either did that immediately before the action or during the action itself as a kind of a flanking manoeuvre. Uh, they left weaponry on the roads and they left a man called White who had been a prisoner in the trucks. By then the IRA were car or the British forces were carrying civilian prisoners regularly in their trucks and White had been picked up that morning. White assisted the IRA in taking uh, the British weaponry and they took it back into the farmhouses. Um, um, so they, they captured quite a haul of weaponry which assisted in the fight that remained ahead of them for the day and they also captured a Lewis machine gun. Uh, luckily for them a bullet had jammed the gun so the heavy fire uh, couldn't be brought to bear on the IRA. And that concluded what was I suppose the ambush itself and what many would say was the first phase of the cross barrier. So we're standing here on the far eastern flank of the IRA's ambush position which is marked by the monument behind me. The second phase, I suppose, of the of the ambush action itself happened here. 
and it happened when troops coming from uh, this direction over here which is Cork City and south of here over that way they joined in the village uh, that's the southern side is the Kinsale side so they joined in the village along with the some of the party there's evidence to suggest that some of the party who were up with uh, who had killed Charlie Hurley that morning were down here in the village as well now they formed a line uh, one line attacking from east to west so this way against the ridge line behind me which is probably roughly where the um, fence is there the the wire fence uh, that was probably a ditch at the time certainly on the old ordnance survey maps it was a partition of some sort so you had the IRA if you like dug in behind that on elevated ground and then the southern section came up from this side over here and swept across right where we are here so you had British uh, infantry if you like attacking a high uh, an elevated IRA position they made good inroads particularly on this side they moved in close to where the monument is now um, and probably at that stage there was a ditch here to our left marking the the boundary of this field I would assume some of the British were in cover behind that uh, the IRA were blazing away from a slightly more elevated position and as I say further over then to the south on this side they were coming in at right angles uh, the British being far lower than the IRA position there so on this side eventually a mine was detonated the mine unfortunately killed Peter Monaghan when it was detonated Peter Monaghan has an interesting story too in that he was uh, a British army deserter Peter Monaghan probably wasn't even his real name he acted as the column engineer for a period when the mine was detonated somewhere near the monument there that scattered the British troops on this side and they retreated over to the south followed shortly by the troops on that side who also retreated back into the village of Crossbarry and that ended the second phase of the ambush action if you like so the third phase of the engagement came in this field uh, which at the time was two fields back behind me about maybe 200 yards behind me here there was a ditch running from north to south and Barry had deployed a flanking section on his rear along that ditch. They were the same section that engaged four lorries down on the road earlier that morning, though they had to come out into this field to do it, this being, as I say, the second of two at the time. Uh, some of them had to come out into this field to engage the lorries below me. So after the ambush itself cleared below on the road, um, we saw there was another attack up, a, quite a severe attack up near the monument. And after that had died away, uh, a group of British soldiers who probably the same soldiers or troops who had been dropped by the lorries further west here towards Bandon uh, came across the fields here and out across the road which is in front of me and down past my position here um, they were met by ferocious fire from inside the ditch here again they were attacking an entrenched enemy I suppose across open ground um, they had very little chance of success because Barry had deployed his, his men so well. So they scattered almost immediately, so quickly in fact that Barry had sent another section up to reinforce them and had to recall that section before uh, the, 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 before they could even get here. The action ended that quickly. Uh, so that was the flanking attack and that ended this phase of the engagement. So uh, I'm standing here at the entrance of an old laneway. Um, much of the weakness uh, with the cross barry accounts as we know them is that they come from the irish perspective so in, it, you're you're reading a lot of what the ira told us happened here little enough work has been done from the british perspective i would expect that to increase and in, in our understanding of this ambush to to, to grow uh, greatly in the years ahead nonetheless what the ira tell us and what is there's reason to believe it's reasonably accurate because they were well deployed they would have had good observation on the roads around us here and they tell us that the British coming from this direction uh, which is generally Ballincollig perhaps some of them came down from Ballymurphy as well there's a number of roads up there they could have come down after the Charlie Hurley incident but they came from this direction out here they came up this road here in front of me and then they entered this laneway behind me um, the laneway is now, it's strictly private property obviously, and it goes into a quarry. Um, but in those days, it was the quarry was much smaller, and it went through two farmers' yards, one of which is long gone now. So the British followed this laneway southwards, and they took a swing west into the farmhouse, which is just to the right of the tree behind us here. Uh, they moved, they continued to move westward through that farmhouse and they emerged into uh, the castle field which is about two fields behind that and there they were met by the rearward section of Barry's column, uh, Kelleher's section. 
they were engaged in the castle field and if you look at Barry's map in particular of, of the ambush it would seem that they moved them across the castle field there were two men in Ballyhandle uh, Castle which is in the field there uh, and a number of uh, volunteers uh, a section lined up um, along a hollow in the southern part of the field they moved the uh, British column back across that field uh, and back through the yard behind us and the eventually Barry sent them reinforcements which I helped them outflank the British really and they moved them back through the farmhouse the British scattered and moved back down into the village here in Cross Barry so that ended that part of the action. So the final phase of the engagement came probably in this field we're not entirely sure but basically Barry uh, had gone up to the castle field uh, to assist uh, the section up there that had attacked the, the rear party closing in on them. Uh, but Barry again, by the time he got his men up there, the British had actually scattered. So he brought them back down this way into a boreen, which is way back there behind me. And down in the bottom left-hand corner of this field was probably where he reassembled the column. He moved them up to the uh, northwest, so they were retreating in this direction. And as they moved along this field, they spotted a group of British soldiers, probably the same soldiers that had been routed in the castle field. And they were reassembling over here on a little hillside, he says, on a little field on a hillside east of Cross Barry, which from here probably looks roughly somewhere around where those two white houses are behind me. So he, lined, he tells us he lined the column up along the ditch, and in fairness, there are more accounts than Barry's to tell us that it happened. Uh, the column were lined up along the ditch, and they fired uh, three volleys in that direction. Uh, to bring effective fire on an enemy at that range is probably difficult, if not nearly impossible. But it was effective in the sense that uh, Barry tells us, and indeed others too, that that, if, as Barry puts it, made up their mind for them. They were congregating, they were perhaps thinking of having another go. The column was retreating, the three volleys were fired, and that scattered the British once again. And that concluded the engagement in Cross Barry itself. Although there were two... Uh, skirmishes fought further to the west of here as the barry as the column retreated into bill into billets that night uh, that ended the day at cross barry which was a monumental day in the irish war of independence events at cross barry will go down in history as the largest engagement of the irish war of independence with hundreds of belligerents involved the cork Tower brigade had successfully evaded capture and certain death but in doing so had also dealt a significant blow against their enemy. As well as inflicting casualties, they had also inflicted a huge blow to the morale of the Crown forces as the supposedly poorly trained and ill-disciplined IRA volunteers had tactically outmaneuvered a vastly superior army force. It has been claimed by some that the events at Crossbury had a further region effect on the overall outcome of the war in gaining a certain respect for the IRA and bringing about a realisation that this guerrilla war would be a prolonged and difficult fight. <laughs>